A close look at the growing SpaceX Starship Pet B pump farm leads to a shocking conclusion. Will we see Starship tankers soon? Ship 36 gets the cold treatment at Massey's and then swaps places with Ship 35, which is ready for its static fire campaign. And there is a lot more to unpack. My name is Felix, welcome to What About It, let's dive right in. Starship Updates on Sunday, Ship 36 had its round of cryoproof testing at Massey's. These tests are crucial procedures to validate the structural integrity of a spacecraft tanks and systems under extreme cold temperatures. The successful completion of this test marks a significant milestone in the development of Ship 36, bringing it one step closer to its intended launch. In the early hours of Tuesday, we saw Ship 36 being rolled back into the mega bay after its return from the test site. So with Ship 35, Ship 37 and the growing Ship 38 in there, things looked like it was getting crowded once again. But wait, something's missing in here. Where did Ship 35 go? SpaceX swapped Ship 35 and 36. While 36 returned from the cryoproofing test, its older sibling took a ride over to Massey's. This ship's going to do a static fire test. And this static fire test was long awaited, as SpaceX was still hunting down the reasons that led to the early demise of the previous two Starship Block 2 test candidates. Knowing that the static fire will take place soon raises hopes that the problems have been identified and resolved. The focus of this test is on the engines, as they were in the center of the catastrophic failures suffered in flights 7 and 8. Whether it was the engines themselves or the supporting structure that led to the rud is still open for debate. One thing has changed already, as our photographer Jordan Guidry found out during the rollout of Ship 36 to Massey's. We cannot sneak a peek at the Raptors anymore when the ship is passing by. The static fire stand, which used to be open at the bottom, has been modified. Unfortunately, the latest addition is a plate that covers this opening. This could be a way to ensure the engine's cleanliness by covering them from the dirt on Highway 4. This would directly fit the theory that the engines were the problem on Flight 7 and 8. A lot hinges on Flight 9, and a successful static fire test is a vital milestone on the path to the next launch. When can we realistically expect to see the next full stack take off from the pad and head into history books? If the static fire tests turn out to be successful, SpaceX will move on to the next steps. Stacking on the OLM and a wet dress rehearsal. Let's take a look at our Flight 9 launch day estimate again after learning all this. In the last episode, I said that the second half of May looks realistic. With Ship 35 at the test stand, this has now changed. Looking at previous timelines, we could see a launch in less than two weeks. Yes, we could be that close. If the static fire works out, you will know. If not, Patience is a must. With starships going back and forth to Massey's, another test candidate's reappearance is eagerly awaited. Test Tank 17 remains elusive after it was briefly spotted outside of the Star Factory. It has since been brought back inside. What makes it so interesting is that it is likely a test article for the upcoming Block 3 boosters. At the Massey's test site, the newly constructed Cam Crusher 2.0 is waiting to put the test tank through its paces. This test campaign is exciting because it is designed to prove the concept developed for the Block 2 boosters. What we will see is the physical start of the next generation of Starship. A few keen-eyed viewers pointed out that Test Tank 17 has large vent-like openings near the top. They asked if those could be Lunar Starship descent thruster openings. Sadly not, my friends. Those openings are for pusher rods on the new Can Crusher 2.0. This way it can apply pressure in even more ways. Let's head over to the ever-busy launch site, specifically Pad B. After mainly discussing the tower, the trench and the launch mount for weeks, it's time to take an in-depth look at an essential area of this new launch infrastructure. The tank and pump farms. Keep watching until the end. This look at the tank farm holds a massive clue to the immediate future of Starship flights. In fact, it might be the craziest sign we've missed so far of how Starship development will continue. Pet A taught the boffins at SpaceX a lot of valuable lessons. One will always be remembered as the concrete tornado. If you launch a starship from a slab of plain concrete, you will end up with a huge hole in the ground. Who would have thought? 
But there was more to the tons of flying debris than just a gaping void below the battered OLM. Remember the original tank farm? Yes, there were vertical tanks here at one point. And as you might have guessed, they did not fare well in that debris barrage coming at them. Consequently, we saw them being replaced with horizontal bullet or sausage tanks rather quickly. From that point on, these have become the new standard for SpaceX tank farms. Just a few vertical units remain, but these are smaller and well out of the way of the forces that come into play on launch day. And most importantly, they are not filled with propellant gases. Some are used to store nitrogen and others are not even tanks at all. They are recondensers used to save some of the otherwise lost boil off gas. This BOG has turned from its liquid form to its gaseous form, for example, during the process of transferring the cryogenic liquid from the tank farm to the Starship on launch day. We all know the endless cryo fog that is rolling over the dunes at these events. It's beautiful, isn't it? But there is a catch. Whenever we see it outside of the system like this, it is lost, gone with the wind. Which brings me to today's sponsor. The internet is an everyday part of our lives, with the average person spending half their day online. I'm looking at you, children. Are you surfing safe though? Are your parents, wives and children aware of digital threats? I have a simple solution to this problem. Surfshark, today's video sponsor, is the go-to VPN to keep your and your family's data private and secure. So what does that mean? Surfshark VPN creates your own private network, keeping out everyone that doesn't belong there. No hackers or data breaches in your house. It's like locking your front door virtually. The Surfshark One cybersecurity package includes a built-in antivirus to protect you from dangers like data worms and Trojan horses. Do you fail to explain these terms to your parents or wife? Surfshark's got your back. It handles everything for you. Wherever you are, be it on the go while using a public internet connection or when you are surfing at home. With proxy emails, instant alerts and a fresh start if your data was compromised. Your single license will protect your whole family. You can use it on as many devices as you like. Have Surfshark take care of your parents or that ever online teenager. Surfshark protects all of those you love with ease. Set a new standard for your family's security. Safety isn't just important in spaceflight. Go to surfshark.com slash felix or use code felix at checkout to get four extra months of Surfshark VPN. The link is in the description and in the pinned comment. Surfshark, your data, your rules. All right, all safe and protected, let's get back to lost gases. The cryo pump and tank facilities at Starbase feature mechanisms that help to save as much of these valuable and, let's face it, expensive commodities. They do this by capturing the gas before it can escape from the system and feeding it to recondensers. These then turn the gas back into a liquid and feed it back to the tank farm. Now let's have a look at what we can already see at the new launch pads construction site. When we look at this area adjacent to Tower B, it is dominated by two groups of horizontal tanks. They fit nicely into two categories, giant tanks and even bigger ones. And these are all water tanks. Contrary to its tactics used at Pad A, SpaceX has decided to cut no corners when it comes to a full-scale deluge system. While it will go a long way to improve Starship launches by protecting the ground and flight hardware, it also means that it will use a lot of water. And while the tank farms for liquid oxygen, methane and nitrogen are shared between the two launch facilities, both launch pads have their own deluge water tank farm. If we just look at the launch site from above, we can see that there is more than one reason not to share these tanks. One is that the pipework for this connection would have been excessively long and complicated due to the property's odd shape. The other is just as obvious. Pad A's deluge water tank farm is small compared to that of Pad B. So before we take a closer look at the water tank farm at Pad B, let me say that creating a Y episode is a team effort. You as a viewer are very much part of this team and you can help us out easily. Our channel metrics show over 4 million returning monthly viewers who have not subscribed yet. Help improve the channel and double check that you've hit the subscribe button to stay up to date with our updates. Like this video if you appreciate the content and become a Y supporter for extra content. Secure your access to up to 7 picture galleries per week, satellite, aerial and ground photos and 3D animations, chat with me and gain more insights on the topic you love. The entire team is waiting for you, you rock! And now back to the water tank farm at Pad B. As you can see, there are two groups of water tanks. Four gigantic ones and five that are still impressive but notably smaller. 
In the middle between these two tank roofs we can see the huge green water pipes coming from below the tanks and then angling up before going down into the ground. This helps to control the flow of the water. In essence, it is a passive system that ensures no water can flow from the tanks to the trench or back unless it is sent there under pressure. The needed pressure is created using nitrogen that is stored in the upright tanks next to the water tanks. In this graphic by Chrome Kiwi, we can see how the two halves of the water tank farm work independently. They both have their own manifold that connects to a weir before connecting to the pipes leading toward the flame trench. While the water line from the four larger tanks feeds into a splitter leading to the left and right portions of the flame diverter, the five smaller tanks feed the deluge system in the launch table. In this photo you can see grey manifold pipes being installed on top of the water tanks. These are the elements that will connect them to the nitrogen tanks. The nitrogen will feed through the manifold under high pressure, effectively forcing water out of the tank and sending it rushing into the green pipes, eventually emerging from the deluge system. Judging from the size of all of this, you can get a good feeling for just how massive this whole operation really is. And that is still just the water. But if you want to launch a rocket, you will need some sort of propellant. In the case of Starship, we are talking about two liquid gases, methane and oxygen. With the propellant tank farm situated comfortably between the two launch pads, sharing the actual tanks is fortunately not a problem. But aside from the storage and its supporting systems, the pumps and valves that are needed for tanking and detanking the Starships and their giant boosters are being custom built from the ground up. In this picture, you can see the massive propellant tanks holding methane and oxygen. And right next to the tanks is where the new pumping infrastructure is being constructed. This is where it gets interesting. Let's start down here. This relatively complicated looking structure is the LOX pump farm. This is where the liquid oxygen is pumped from the tanks and sent toward the ship and booster in a super cooled, highly pressurized state. As you can see, there are nine units sitting side by side. Some are still missing components such as pumps and motors, but the structure is advanced enough to talk about it. So here we go. Take a look at these manifolds on the upper side of the pumps. They connect the pumps to form two groups. Now here comes the way more interesting than you might think part. We found something. One group serving the booster has five pumps, while the second group with four pumps should be dedicated to the ship. Now this decision seems a bit odd, given that the booster needs more than double the amount of propellant. So why did they go for a five and four configuration? Wouldn't it be smarter to split it six to three, thereby better representing the amounts of liquids pumped into two respective parts of a Starship full stack? Do you know? Here's the surprisingly simple answer. They are looking into the future and it is coming fast. The soon to come block three starships will be stretched and their tanks will grow. But then the coming block two or V3 super heavy boosters will do just the same. So that can't be the reason, right? What else would shift this ratio? A Starship tanker variant is the likely reason for this decision. It will take much more fuel than a normal Starship. We know that this variant is needed to give Starship the capability of reaching the Moon, Mars and beyond. It is also becoming increasingly urgent to bring this variant from the drawing board to the launch mount. Artemis 3 is on the horizon and without the HLS Starship variant, there won't be a moon landing. No tanker, no HLS, no moon landing. Simple as that. But when can we expect to see this Starship variant? Tankers will appear soon and the first sign of them should become visible on their nose cones. So we'll keep watching out for unusual nose cones appearing behind the windows of the Star Factory. How will SpaceX design the connectors for these prototypes? Yes, plural. They will need to build two Starship prototypes capable of propellant transfer to demo the process. At least one of them needs to be a tanker, the second could be either a tanker or a starship with orbital refueling capability. Exciting times are incoming, what do you think? How long until we see tanker starship hardware? Best guesses in the comments. Let's see who gets it right, I believe in less than 3 months from now. The tanker's outstanding features are the interface hardware and of course bigger or additional tanks. These things are space freighters carrying propellant up to the starship fuel depot. And yes, the fuel depot is another variant we still need to see being built. Coming back to the topic of the pumps, when you consider that tankers will not only make their debut shortly, but also become a frequent occurrence, this is a good reason for splitting the pumps into groups of 5 and 4. 
Slowly but surely, we'll see a shift toward operational launches. Of course, SpaceX still has to test a plethora of things in the Starship program. But we should also see it enter operational service in the not too distant future. One possible scenario would be to use the Space Coast launchpad for commercial purposes while Starbase remains the giant space laboratory for the time being. Isn't it funny how much you can read into some half-finished pump racks? I love my hobby. It's a good hobby. To wrap things up at the pump farm, let's have a quick look above the LOX pump rack. This is its counterpart, the liquid methane pump rack. It looks like there will be one less pump for a total of eight. And judging from the manifold connection, they will be spread evenly in a 4x4 setup. Next to the pump racks, you can find the cooling units, one for methane and one for oxygen. From there, the liquids are fed into the fuel lines leading to the OLM. These are embedded in the commodities trench that runs right below the water tanks. It is already largely covered up, but the two expansion loops are still visible. These are built in to compensate for the contraction and expansion of the pipes that occur due to the massive temperature changes. These pipes flex. Now you're a rocket tank farm pro, you're welcome. You know what is even cooler than a massive change in temperature? A massive change of perspective. And what better way to get a new perspective than to take flight in a helicopter? Check out redlineheli.com slash felix for a once in a lifetime experience and $25 off flying in a helicopter above Starbase. The Redline Heli team is waiting for you. They'll show you the same views our photographer gets on his Starbase flights. Give it a try. And, and now to something completely different. different. Let's talk Kuiper. Last Tuesday was an important day for the fledgling Kuiper project. The first 27 satellites of Amazon's Kuiper broadband internet constellation launched aboard an Atlas 5551 rocket provided and operated by United Launch Alliance. While in itself this sounds like good news, Amazon is in for a serious challenge if it wants to develop Kuiper in a fully operational system made up of a total of 3,326 Kuiper satellites. As we've reported before, Amazon needs to bring at least half its constellation into orbit by July 2026 in order to secure its license by fulfilling the requirements set by the FCC. To meet that requirement, they would need around one launch of 27 satellites per week. This sounds crazy. But a main competitor is showing that this is indeed possible. I'm of course talking about SpaceX and its Starlink constellation. The reality is harsh, but just as Amazon launched its first Kuiper batch, SpaceX launched batch 250 of its Starlink constellation just two days prior. With this launch, it now consists of more than 7,200 operational satellites. If this were a 100 lap race, SpaceX would be leading by more than 99 laps at the time Amazon puts their car on the track. Overtaking at this point is out of the question, but Amazon really needs to focus on satellite launches if it wants to persuade the FCC to grant it some extra time to deploy its constellation. They will need that extra time as the only provider offering the capability and cadence to fit Kuiper's needs is SpaceX and Jeff Bezos will at all costs try to avoid their service. With all the talk about mega constellations, I want to bring something into perspective. Right now, there are around 12,000 active satellites circling Earth. Over 7,000 of those are SpaceX Starlinks. Now here's where it gets crazy. Estimates see the number of active satellites possibly grow to 60,000 by 2030. Wait, what? The second new Glenn flight is on the horizon. One more major milestone was achieved on April 24th when Blue Origin successfully performed a full duration 15 second static fire test on the upper stage's two BE3U engines. During the test, the engines achieved enhanced performance, increasing the maximum thrust to 778 kN per engine, which slightly increased the payload weight limit. The BE-3U is a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, cryogenic rocket engine and a close relative to the BE-3PM engine that is used to great success on the new Shepard rocket. So Blue Origin is speeding up, the question is just if it's fast enough. 
That's it for today. Before watching the bloopers, remember to smash that like button. Subscribe for more. This is what fuels the algorithm and this is how you can help us for free. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. A new Raptor design and our brand new Mechazilla fan club design are both up. Link is in the description and in the card you should see now. Also check out our print store at shop.whataboutit.space to buy a picture for your favorite wall. A significant amount of every purchase goes directly to our photographer. And if you want to learn more about SpaceX history and why Starship is skipping leg day, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. But sorry. After mainly dis discussing get picked to look get picked to poof deep. All right, all mechanisms. They do this. They do this, dude. Holy moly. Are you kidding me? They do this. <laughs>